Hello, my name is Wendy Myers of MyersDetox.com. Welcome to the Myers Detox podcast. Today we have a great show with Susan Morley talking about how to parent during a pandemic. And she had so many helpful tips. I have you know, a 10-year-old daughter, Winter, and this show helped me so much. It gave me a lot of really good ideas about things that I can do to just set up a routine better to for discipline and how to talk to your child and lots of really good tips, you know, how to manage little ones, even elementary kids, tweens and teenagers socially and emotionally during this time, why you shouldn't feel guilty and even can feel good about screen time. Kids are spending a lot of time on the screen while children, our parents are working during the day. Should we also talk about um, how you can best create boundaries and family routines and rules. Super important right now. Kids need schedules. And we'll also talk about some tips on discipline, why spanking doesn't work, and how can a parent handle children who are angry and agitated, defiant. So lots of really good tips about that. And access to Susan's free parenting during a pandemic course, really an invaluable resource for you guys today. And I want to tell you guys about my new podcast. It's called the Coronavirus Support Series. And Susan is a guest on that uh, podcast as well. I encourage you guys to go uh, listen to that because I'm wanting to provide you guys with lots of tools right now to help you through this lockdown, help you through this crisis. It's unprecedented in our lifetime and very stressful for a lot of people. So I wanted to do this podcast, the Coronavirus Support Series, to help you guys manage all this. From, and it's not like about health or supplements or anything like that. It's mostly think, podcasts like this, like parenting, uh, finances, stress, meditations, I know how to manage your emotions, uh, you know, starting an online business, lots of really great practical, actionable tips to help you manage. Just go check that out. It's also available as a video series, like a summit at coronavirussupportseries.com. Go check it out. Our guest today, Susan. Susan Morley makes being a mom easier. She teaches moms how to be in control without being controlling. Susan uses her certifications in education, parenting, recovery, and Whole30 to help moms in every aspect of parenting. You can learn more about Susan Morley and her work at susanmorley.com. Be sure to go there and get her free course, Parenting During a Pandemic. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Hi, thanks for having me. So I was really excited to have you come on because all to all the parents out there that are, is this really my life now? We need some help. <laughs> we need some tips. So what do you recommend for, for parents who are now schooling their children at home? Yes. Okay. So first of all, I think we all could take a collective nice deep breath and let it all out because we have help. We are not actually homeschooling. I know we're really adding a lot to our plate. But we've got teachers and curriculum to help us and everybody's in the same boat. So we don't have to worry about our child falling behind or getting something wrong on a worksheet. I think we need to just really take a much more relaxed attitude. So that's the very, very first thing before you even think about planning or scheduling, just take a deep breath and tell yourself it's going to be okay. <laughs> yes. Yes. And so I've, I'm really, you know, uh, you know, amazed at how fast the winter, my daughter's school got everything online and created this Google mm -hmm. classroom, which I didn't know about. So it's, it's really, really neat. And they meet over zoom like we're doing right now. Right. Um, right so right. it's just, uh, it's really interesting how that, that came together so quickly, but um, are there any tips that, that you have for parents? Like say if they're, child, uh, their child's school didn't get together an online curriculum or just canceled school for the rest of the year? Yeah. So the, the very first thing, 
And really it has less to do with education and I think more to do with your children's mental health. And that is create some structure. These children need structure. If you remember back to your time in um, high school, even a bell rang, you could count on a bell ringing. You could count on your next class being the same thing. If there was a fire drill, you knew exactly where to go and what to do. And children thrive on that. And when all that gets goes away, that causes a lot of anxiety for children. So one of the best things you can do for your child is to create structure. So I like to start with what time you, how much sleep they need, which by the way, you're going to need to add like an hour to every children, to every child's bedtime. We need an extra hour too, because there's so much stress. So figure out what time they need to go to bed. And then maybe they wake up. If you want them to wake up if they're teenagers at nine instead of seven, like before, that's fine. But probably by nine o'clock, they need to be up and getting productive. And then just have, you can have it a loose schedule, but have an activity and then play, rest, tech, going outside, something. And then another school type activity. Khan Academy, they have created a schedule for parents. It's amazing and activities for you to do. So actually, it's the only that kind of resource you need, in my opinion, is Khan Academy. And it's all free. I love Khan Academy. I love that. I saw the guy on 60 Minutes and just what he's trying to accomplish and create. Mm -hmm. I just love it so much. So yeah, that's a great resource. Thank you. Yeah. And so, and I'm, I love waking up later. (laughs) I'm kind of loving this because, you know, I'd have to get up at seven before and now I can just sleep in and then winter gets more sleep. So it's, I like it, but, but yeah, I do, I, I do feel like I need to create a little bit more, more structure and boundaries. So do you have any tips to create more more boundaries or family routines and rules to just kind of to help parents uh, just create a better environment for their kids? Absolutely. And this is a little counterintuitive. The number one tip to figuring out what your family schedule should be is to ask the kids. And parents, I can hear them. I can hear them right now. Oh. I'm not doing that. What? <laughs> No, 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 really, you're going to be surprised. So I think there's a a structured way you can do it. You just have a family meeting and the number, there are two rules for a family meeting. Number one, make them fun. Play some music like the Rocky theme beforehand, (laughs) pop some popcorn. So it's something to look forward to. Um, So that's number one. Rule number two, keep them short. 30 minutes at the most. We are not, look, nobody likes a long meeting. So you have to be respectful of your kids as well. But in that family meeting, just get out a piece of paper and just say, all right, let's write it down. Make somebody a secretary. Let's brainstorm all the ideas of how we think our days should go Monday through Friday. And then you have the discussion. After the family meeting, you're not going to have everything done and buttoned down. That's okay. Because remember, what we started with is we're going to take a deep breath and we're going to relax. There is no deadline here. And you say, okay, we'll revisit this tomorrow. Maybe it's before, during, or after dinner. And you continue. You just have that family meeting. I think by three family meetings in a row, you should have a pretty good idea of structure. The kids are going to create rules. They know because they've been in school. And if they create it, they're way more likely to follow through and adhere to those limits and boundaries. Yeah. I mean, my biggest concern is, you know, scheduling in exercise for my child because staying indoors for the most part, you know, really throws a wrench in just her physical health, not getting exercise. So I've been meaning to like do a yoga class with her in the morning or maybe rebounding or just doing a little something every day. And Mm -hmm. then also screen time, you know, I have guilt because I'm busy. I'm trying to work. I've got stuff I got to do. And, uh, you know, my daughter's spending a lot of time in front of the screen. Uh, what are some of your tips for that? 
Okay, so I'm going to sound like a broken record, but let's give ourselves a collective break on the screen time just for the next month. <laughs> we just all promise that we're not going to feel guilty for last month or the coming month on screen time because we're all just trying to, to figure it out. And um, it's giving their brains a break from processing what's happening. We don't even really know what's happening, right? So we're all under a lot of stress. So first of all, give yourself a break. Second of all, I love your ideas, Wendy. Yoga and rebounding, and I think that's amazing. If you have a flexible schedule and you're able to schedule in even 10 minutes, look, elementary school kids are used to 10 minutes of an activity. So just even 10 minutes of something with you, it could be cat and cow poses. And then that's good for you because you've been sitting in a chair working. And then you say, okay, got to go back to work and have her go to back to work. So you don't necessarily have to schedule them in. You can just grab them and say, quick yoga break and do something. You can also say, okay, let's take a walk, those kinds of things. You can also have them do things on their own, especially if you've already taught them how to do certain things. But if you have a backyard or a porch, you can say, you know what, I'm going to set the timer, go out there. I don't care if you read, no devices allowed. I don't care if you just look at the clouds for 30 minutes, but you need to go outside um, and just make sure they are old enough to understand they can't leave the porch and they can't interact with people, et cetera. Yeah, I mean, I like your comment about not feeling guilty about the screen time because I, th I think in a certain way, it's it can be how kids are coping uh, and maybe not not having to, you know, because I know they overhear conversations with mommy and daddy. They hear mm -hmm. news if dad's playing and, you know, and, and I think a lot of kids aren't maybe not talking about it, but they're processing that in some ways and maybe getting on and playing games with their friends like Roblox. My daughter's playing Roblox with other kids Good. Yes. and getting on the phone with her friends. And it's a way for them to, to deal with this. You know, thank you for bringing that up. I really think that any kind of socializing on this, the devices should not count against their screen time. That, that should be almost unlimited. So can I just jump in with some, an idea that I love? Um, for lunchtime, because school children, children who go to school, they're used to socializing all day long in between classes and halt. They have so much socializing time, and now they have none, almost none. So now... We have to try to make up for that. So at lunch, have a lunch bunch where if there's an iPad and a computer and a, a, a phone, you can FaceTime with three people or you can do a Zoom, a group Zoom with your um, kids. And there are, now there's good, safe, private ways to do it so people aren't jumping in on your children's lunch bunch call. But you can have them have a little Zoom and they're just going to talk over each other, but they get to see each other and they're eating at the same time. So this isn't adding anything to your schedule. They're used to socializing during a meal with their friends five days a week. So is, I don't want to add too much burden on creating these Zoom dates, but if you could just throw the meeting out there to a, a list of parents and say, you know, we're going to be live every weekday you know, from 11 to 11.30, hop in if you can, or whatever the lunchtime is, I think that would really help. And then at dinner, you can invite grandparents, aunts, uncles, cousins. You can invite them to dinner. You can just FaceTime them, put an iPad on the table, and they can eat their dinner while you're eating your dinner. And then you'll, you can have a family meal. I love that idea because, you know, I hadn't really thought about doing that, but my daughter's kind of talking one-on-one -on -one with her friends, but that's such a great idea to just do a Zoom call and have it like scheduled so people can come on if they want, if they choose to in a group right. setting. I love that. Any other socializing tips uh, that you can give parents to help their kids maybe connect with other people more? So I'll just, I want to just address a couple of things. The latest, and this could change by the time people hear this, but the latest is for older children, not babies, that if they're out in public, they wear masks. And if they're running around and breathing heavily, 
definitely your social distancing needs to be more than six feet. Um, and then just walking or biking six feet social distance. So keeping that in mind, and please always check the CDC website for the latest up-to-date information. Um, I think going out and walking in the neighborhood. So one thing that my neighborhood does every day at 7.30 is we do the neighborhood wave. So we all come out on our porches and uh, we wave and sometimes the kids bring instruments or maybe a kid will go on the street and do a dance and then they'll go on their porch and another kid does a dance on their porch. And so you can just, there's a million things you can do with that. Another thing that is a good idea is to just have like a group art project in front of somebody's house with sidewalk chalk and everybody adds something to it. I've seen beautiful pictures where People have used um, painter's tape to create designs and shapes and then just leave the chalk out there and let people color in a piece or a section. Um, and then when people take a walk, they can, they can see that. Um, and then the other thing that we're doing, and I, I have one right there in my window, is a bear hunt. Have you heard about doing the bear hunt? No, no, I haven't. Oh my gosh, it's so adorable. So in my neighborhood... Some fabulous mom said, all right, I'm making a Google map. Um, and it goes along with the children's board book, um, Going on a Bear Hunt. And y'all all know the Going on a Bear Hunt. So you can go on a bear hunt in your neighborhood. So what one mom did is she created a Google map. So if you're tech savvy, you can do this. And you just send an email out and say, reply with your address if you're going to put a bear or a stuffed animal in your window. And so when you go for a walk with your kids down different streets, you already have a Google map of what homes have a bear in the window. And so you can look for the bear up in the different windows while you're taking a walk. And you could say, oh, that's James's house or that's Sarah Jane's house. And so you get to maybe not completely socialize, but you get to at least wave through windows or see their bears in the windows. Oh, I love that. That's so cute. I love that. And can we talk about small children? So kids that are not yes. yet of school age and how parents can manage work and supervising their little ones? Yeah. So the number one rule for this after you take a deep breath <laughs> is really let's think about what your expectations are because if your expectations that your toddler is going to play independently for 30 minutes or more, I think you need to rethink your expectations. By three years old, a child has the developmental ability to play independently for 30 minutes. Probably a lot of three-year-olds today aren't aren't exercising that ability. Um, and that's fine. They can do it, but you have to get them there. So the number one is set your expectations at the proper place so that you're not frustrated. And then you don't end up yelling at your kid and then your kid is crying and then you feel guilty and ugh, that's no good. So what you need to do is train your children to play independently. And you just, there's a simple way to do it. You just set the timer for five minutes, tell them to be in an activity and you'll be right back. And then you gradually increase the time over time. So you're going to have to get there. Um, the other thing is frequent breaks. So if you've ever been to a preschool, the preschools have centers. So you have a housekeeping center and a community helper center and a kitchen center, et cetera, et cetera. Children, they learn about life and they um, grow so fast and their little, the synapses in their brains all fire and connect when they're playing. And another thing that play does for children and adults is it is a stress reliever. So you need to set up the house in a way or your living room. And it doesn't have to be like a preschool. Don't look on Pinterest because you'll just start comparing yourself and you'll feel bad. Just set up. This is a block area. This is an art area, et cetera. And so then you're just going to have to help your child transition from area to area, frequent snacks, frequent potty breaks and frequent connection with your child will give them the reassurance that you're just, you know, 
a, just a room away or something, and that they can play independently for up to 30 minutes for a three-year-old, and then more and more as they get older. Okay, fantastic. And what about tweens and teens? Any tips for them and what to do with them at home? Yeah, so they'll probably have some some projects. Um, there's a, uh, for school, and hopefully they're independent. Um, so I'm just going to talk about in general for children who just do their work. There's a whole nother thing we can talk about for children who are struggling to do that. Um, but we're just going to talk about the average kid for now. Um, so these students will do the work, but then they're on TikTok for three hours. <laughs> you know, and you're, it's hard when they're teenagers to kind of get them off. So for teens, as you may remember, the importance of that peer relationship skyrockets. And it's really very, very difficult for tweens and teens right now. They're struggling. And so anything that you can do that is safe, like for me, I had a no Snapchat rule. And I probably would keep that rule even during now. But, um, well, I do with my 16-year-old. I have an 18-year-old also. I can't really do anything <laughs> much about that um for her they're an adult right yeah yeah, sir she's 18 (laughs) and i think she's going to respect my wishes but there's i mean but that was back in the day now there are so many other apps you just have conversations with them and just i would talk to them and say hey how is so and so have you talked to so and so what is this person doing or that person um just check in with them to make sure they are in contact with their friends. Suggest very gently, because they don't like to do anything we suggest. Just suggest, hey, did you want to have a, a chat or did they want to drive over and stand in the yard and wave so y'all can socially distance talk? I mean, I'll make sure I'm inside so I'm not listening, etc. Offer those kind of safe opportunities to, um, to, for them to connect because they really, really need that. And then at night, tuck them in. I know it sounds weird because they're teenagers, but they haven't been tucked in a lot. So go in, hey, good night. And they'll probably say, oh, good night. And you say, okay. It just be there. I think they need so much to know that we're still there for them and that we're available because when they're ready to talk, they will. So here's one last tip for teens. Get a ball, any ball, a bouncy ball, a ball of tinfoil, I don't care, and just start tossing it back and forth. Don't say anything. Just start tossing the ball back and forth with them. They'll start talking. Okay, fantastic. And so what about kids and, you know, how can we help them cope with the change, this drastic change, isolation, fear, and any stress that's in the household? Because, you know, parents are dealing with a lot of new emotions and a lot of fear Mm -hmm. and stress and financial fears. How do we protect Mm -hmm. our children from that and lead them through this crisis? So I don't know if there's a way to protect them from all of that. What I can say is that this is an opportunity to build resilience. And so one of the keys um, for building resilience is children in children, uh, I really love the book by Carol Dweck called Mindset. So when they get frustrated and they can't do something, we just add the word yet to the end. I can't tie my shoe. And so we say, well, you can't yet. Let's try again tomorrow. So just constantly providing that hope and that uh, conviction that you believe in them, that things are going to be okay is really important. Um, so any, any material you can read, like I just, like I said, mindset is a very good one, building that resilience for children, um, saying, being honest, things are really weird right now. These are some strange times. And, you know, a hundred years ago, something like this happened and look, we're here. So it's not, wasn't the end of the world. These things are going to change for a while, but we will not just bounce back. But our goal is that we want to be better than before. So what kind, then you can ask if they're older, what kind of things would make our family better after this? Maybe they say, I want to keep family game night. 
Maybe they say, I want us to keep eating dinners together. So we may learn some things about our family structure and the way we were living our lives just a few months ago that maybe they weren't serving our family so well. So we think it's a good time to reflect, maybe create a family mission statement since we have to relook at anything, everything anyway, and just really say, hmm, what are our values? And then the other thing is um, there are, you can get them on Amazon, like an emotions poster. My children loved theirs for years and years and years. And it's a poster and it has pictures of children with different facial expressions and the name of the emotion underneath. Jealous, sad, happy, glad, angry, etc. And having that in the house, and you can even, you don't even have to buy a poster. You can just take pictures of your child making different expressions with their face and then you can tape them up on the wall with the names of the emotion under it. And then you can help them identify their feelings because it really does help when we identify our feelings. For example, there are a lot of articles about grief and I was surprised. I am having a lot of grief right now. There's a lot that's changing and a lot that I miss. And our children have that too. So when we can have the language incorporate it in a very open and honest way, and then be an empathetic listener. I hear you. That must be hard for you. How can I help you? Those kinds of things can really, really not protect them from what's going on, but help them thrive in spite of what's going on. Yeah. I've been making sure to ask my daughter, you know, how are you feeling right now? Are you doing okay? Kind of letting her know I'm mm-hmm. checking in on her emotionally mm-hmm. and, and talking to her about my feelings. Yes. Telling her what's going on, you know, ma- making, being very honest with her about what is happening in the world. And this is a crazy time for everyone and not be fearful, but we're just being smart and staying home to protect ourselves. Just putting it in as, you know, uh, uh, as good a perspective as I can with, and while at the same time being honest. Yeah. And I love that you said that because when we say to our child, just, if we just say, how are you feeling? Fine. Right. But if we say to our child, Ooh, you know, I was feeling a little sad today and we start there boy, that really opens the door for a conversation. And they might say, why? And you say, mm, I miss Thursday night with my girlfriends. I really miss them. And then have you been feeling you know, sad about missing your friends lately? Now it's easier to have that conversation because you've opened up first. Because it's hard to open up sometimes. And, and what about kids that are agitated and angry or kids with a short fuse? Like how can a parent, you know, handle children who are angry or acting out, having tantrums or even sibling, conf- uh, sibling conflict? Right. Okay. So um, there was a, oh, I forgot her name, but a woman, she's a therapist and she had said, you know, we need to really consider that when our children are acting out or or angry, it really may be grief. The underlying emotion could be grief. So if they're acting out short fuse, I had a client last night, she called me and she said, man, the kids were just blowing up and we, my husband and I couldn't figure it out. And we realized it was one o'clock and we hadn't fed them lunch yet. So that's where having that schedule can really help because they are just like plowing through work. You know, and they hadn't realized their lunchtime is normally 11 a.m. at school. And so these kids were operating on fumes, and of course they were getting into fights. So once you know that they're fed and they've had enough sleep and you provided that structure, if they're having a lot of blow-ups, there's a great tool called Take 5, and it's very similar to breathing, and you just take their hand and you teach this to them and you tell them you breathe up as you trace up your thumb and breathe out as you go down and you breathe up as you go up and you breathe down and you do this for the whole hand and they can do it on their own fingers and they are breathing in and out very slowly 
not hyperventilating, and they are able to calm down. That really resets your brain. It engages, they don't have much of a frontal cortex developed yet, but it really does engage that frontal part of the brain instead of that really deep part of the brain, what I call the caveman brain. And then they're able to calm down. Then you might be able to say, are you hungry? Do you need a hug? You want to rest? You know, they might be frustrated with a math problem. Maybe somebody on the Zoom call on the lunch bunch called them a poopy head, you know, and that really hurt their feelings. So that is just a way to calm them down. Now, teens, I don't know if they're going to want to do that, um, but you can just tell them, let's calm down. And you can use your hands to signal, signal that you're calming down. A great tip is just to sit on the floor. If your teenager is arguing with you, just sit on the floor or lie down on the floor. They're going to look at you like you're crazy, but they probably will stop yelling too. And the third tip is when children get loud, your voice goes down. So you end up at a whisper. And when you're whispering, they're having to lean in and really pay attention and they can't make any noise if they're to hear you. And so that's just a super secret teacher trick that I used to use in the classroom. Yeah. And to kind of bring their frequency down a little bit. So it's not so mm -hmm. agitated. It's hard to do that sometimes. Exactly. <laughs> yes. That's why we have to take a deep breath. first. Yeah. <laughs> and I've been thinking about, you know, cause I do, I do these little meditations and, you know, listen to these guided meditations with calming music and, you know, uh, winters, you know, my daughter is about 10 now. So it's, kind of a time right now is a perfect time to start doing those with your child together to start teaching them some tools for calming themselves down and meditation start thinking in that that mindset to give them that tools that they need when they're feeling anxious yes yes and that's why i like this because they can do this under a desk during a test you know when they go back to school um, they can do that before a performance or, you know, you can do it very quietly to train yourself um, to calm down, to control that breathing. And meditation is awesome. Yes, yes, I love it. And so, um, so how are parents contributing to the problem? So, so when their kids are acting out, when they are um, upset or they're yelling at their parent, I mean, many times they can be modeling their parents' behavior, their parents' personality. So what can parents do differently? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. So I think I, I would have three things. Um, number one, we need to have a plan. So I've already said that, but it's so important. Have a plan and have proper expectations. So that's one. Number two, um, something I call mom in the mirror, for sure. We need to look at the mom in the mirror. How's my voice? How, am, I, am I coming in the living room? What's going on? Have you changed your school book? If I'm coming into a room like that, they're going to respond the exact same way. Emotions are contagious. Okay, so that's really keep that in mind. So check yourself. Um, the third thing is if we hadn't set up before this, pandemic, if we hadn't set up appropriate boundaries and limits, if we have not taught our children that, then they're not going to understand that it's not okay to interrupt or walk in a room without knocking. And they're not going to understand that they have to wait for things. So you may have to go back and teach them some things that, frankly, maybe you let slide before, but now you really have to tighten it up. So setting those limits and boundaries, don't yell at them about it. You haven't taught them yet, right? So you just teach them, listen, from I used to let you interrupt, you're now seven years old, you're not going to interrupt me anymore. If you need me and you can see that I'm busy, you may stand at my door when it's open, you just stand there and you wait for me to do like this and invite you in. You just teach them whatever skill. And then after you teach them, you can't just tell them once and think they have it. They're children. And so you need to then say, okay, let's practice. And then you say, okay, let's switch. You be me sitting at my desk and I'll be you at the door. 
and you practice and you practice and you teach and you role play. And now you can have an appropriate expectation that they'll remember. If they forget, we're not going to yell at them. We're going to say, mm, there's a special way. I taught you how to come in if you need me. They'll remember and then they'll do it. And do you have any tips for discipline? So I know a lot of parents are, you know, at home with their kids. They feel guilty. Maybe they're not spending enough time with them. Yeah. And a lot of parents just out of habit, parent out of guilt, you know, give in to their kids when they're crying and, and whatnot. Do you have any tips for discipline during this time? Yeah. So number one probably goes without saying, but I always like to say it. We know for sure now, today, spanking is just not effective. And you can have a lot of opinions about it, but I can tell you for sure, it just is not effective. There are many better ways to give discipline. So we'll get that out of the way. Um, yelling, here's the thing about yelling at your kids. It's a stress relief for you and your kids pay the price. So I'm not saying I never yell. <laughs> because I'm human, but I'm much better than I used to be. Much, much, much. And now my kids are older. So the more in control of ourselves, we can be the better. So just don't feel, I don't want to give guilt trips. I'm just saying your kids are paying the price for your stress release. So the way to avoid a lot of having to give consequences or handle misbehavior or give discipline is because of the pre-work of discipline, which is, like I said, creating some structure and setting the rules, have the family mating, create some family rules, get them involved. And so that, that's going to get you 90% of where you want to be. And then kids are kids. They're going to misbehave. So I say, don't address it in the moment. If it's Monday through Friday and it's a work day, don't address it right then. What are you going to do? Have a screaming match right before your Zoom call? No, then you're, that's not going to work. So let's say your little boy, Jim Bob, you was playing Legos in your office, but now you need that space for a Zoom call. So you tell Jim Bob, Jim Bob, I've got a Zoom call in 15 minutes. I want you to come here. I want you to pick up all these Legos, put them in the basket in the corner. I'll be back in five minutes to see that it's done. So you have 15 minutes before your call. You've given him five minutes and that gives you 10 minutes, right? To handle it. You come back in your office. The Legos are still there. You can call him back in and try to force him to do it and you get all upset and have a screaming match or by the way, you're not going to throw them away because they're expensive. Don't throw away the Legos. They're this really expensive. a plastic or a fortune. <laughs> I know. So don't throw them away. Um, you're just going to pick them up and you're going to put them in the basket. Oh, I know you don't want to hear that. I know. Parents are like, ah, but I told him. He didn't do what I told him to. Remember this. All good things come to those who wait. Okay, so now it pays to be a grown-up and have a fully developed frontal cortex, okay? After your Zoom call, maybe after dinner, when um, you would normally play Tickle Monster or do something extra fun with Jim Bob, he's going to ask for it. Maybe it's Wednesday and you have ice cream every Wednesday. You're going to say, oh. I'm so sorry. We're not doing that today. In fact, you're going straight to bed. And Jim Bob's going to ask, like, what's going on? Why not? And you're going to say, I'm really glad you asked me. At 3.45 today, I asked you to pick up all your Legos, or I told you to, because I had a Zoom call at 4 o'clock. And I told you I'd be back in five minutes. And when I came back, the Legos were there. So I did your job and my reward for doing your job is that I get two scoops of ice cream after dinner tonight instead of one. And you're going to go to bed early because you didn't listen to mommy. Now is bedtime going to be a joy? No, <laughs> but there's no zoom call after. 
And you can manage that and you can still be super sweet at bedtime and you can still give him his bedtime story. You're just putting him to bed earlier. You're not going to punish him or guilt him or shame him for not listening. He's already had his consequence. And then the next day, it's a brand new day. It's all forgotten and forgiven because we need to make sure our children understand that even though they misbehave and make mistakes, they will always be loved and they will always have a place in our home no matter what. And so giving them that sense of security is going to be really important, especially now because they don't really have any other outlets. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's also really important to learn about child development and what expectations to have uh, emotionally and otherwise with children at different ages and stages and so that you do have realistic expectations and don't get as angry, you know, like just knowing that kids really don't have a lot of control over their emotions till they're seven or eight, perhaps, because that part of their brain isn't developed. Just things like that. They don't have as much impulse control thinking about the consequences of their action as much as, say, an adult or a teenager. And I think knowing that can help you to uh, not be as frustrated with them. Are there any books you can recommend on that subject? Yeah, thank you. That was such a good point, and it's very, very important. My client last night was like, oh, for God, I'm dealing with a four-year-old and a six-year-old. They can't, you know, entertain themselves for an hour at a time. She just, you know, she's not a preschool teacher. You know? <laughs> she's not used to having them in a structured environment. She's just used to having them on the weekends when it's all fun, fun, fun. So give yourselves a break. You, you're not supposed to know this. So I would go to the Academy, um, the uh, Academy of Pediatrics. They, they're the association. I'm, I'm, I'm messing up the name. I apologize. Just Google it; it'll come up. It's the American Academy of Pediatrics. There you go. Yes. And they have, um, and I'm not going to get the website right because there's there's two very similar, but it's it's Healthy Kids. And it's, I think it's .org, but you can find it from the Academy of, um, of the Pediatrics website. That is going to be your go-to resource because they have so many awesome links, very simple pages about what to expect at different ages and stages. And remember, it's a guideline. Some kids are going to be really developed in one area and not developed in another. My firstborn she never crawled. She went straight to walking, but she walked very late. Second born, walked very early, talked very late. So every child is different. So it's not a hard and fast. It speaks in generalities, but it will give you an idea of what you should be able to expect. And there's a, I have a great list I give to my um, clients about chores. Yes, your three-year-old can do chores. I, their toddlers are low to the ground. It's easy for them to dust the baseboards. There's a lot of pollen flying around. You might want your day, baseboards dusted. Um, and so there are chores that all the children should be doing and participating in. And that keeps them busy. It makes them feel like an important part of the family. And no, you're not going to pay them. It's just what we do as part of our family. Yeah, I've been meaning to do that. I've been meaning to make like maybe a poster with some star things. I remember being super motivated by those little gold stars um, yeah. and creating like a list of chores and, you know, having her and you know, my child do them every day or whether it's like their homework assignments or extracurricular or typing club or, and then all the chores also that she needs to complete every day. So she just has a nice little guide about what she needs to complete every day. Yeah. So the simpler, the better, really the simpler, the better. And, um, as far as stickers, I I'm fine with them just so they can mark that they've done it. I'm not a fan of a lot of reward. We need to give feedback to our children continually. I appreciate the way you did such a good job on wiping the counter. We're not going to have a party just because they wiped the counter, but you know, just saying, thank you. It looks so good. Oh, so nice starting to cook dinner with a clean counter. Oh, how nice. Just those kinds of things. That's enough praise that's really heartfelt and sincere, um, not just made up because you feel like you have to praise your kid. 
Um, but yeah, the keep it simple with the chores and, um, and make it part of everybody pitches in. Yeah, fantastic. Well, Susan, thank you so much for this conversation. I know that's going to help so many parents out there looking for, for answers. And you have a whole course on parenting. Can you talk yeah. about that and where to find that? I do. I really, I threw it together so quickly and I, I just, it, it's surprisingly well organized. It must have been divine. I don't know what happened, but I'm very excited about it. It's called Parenting During a Pandemic, and it's part of my Mom Tribe membership, but it's absolutely free. It's completely free um, because I know that so many parents are going to need resources, and I'd seen so many Pinterest and on Facebook, and I did this and I did that, and I thought, oh my gosh, I can't <laughs> compete. Like, who has the time? Some moms have the time, and you know what? bless you because you're the ones who say, I'm going to the store. Did you need anything? And you are so important. And I love my moms on the street who have time and they are so generous. So thank you. Um, but for those moms who really are feeling overwhelmed and they don't feel crafty and they just want the most simple, easiest way, this is who my audience really is. Simple, practical, and you can bounce around to see what lessons you know works for you. And I'm adding new content so far every week. Fantastic. And so where can we find that? Oh, yes. Yeah. So if you go to, that would be great. So if you go to, you can just go to my website, um, susanmorley.com. So that's S-U-S-A-N. Morley is M-O-R-L-E-Y.com it'll be, there'll be, as soon as you go on there, there'll be a pop-up. You can't miss it. I made it very obvious. And so you can just click on it and sign up right there. That's the easiest way to sign up. And again, it's hundred percent free. So have your friends go on there and tell me if you find any typos, cause I did this very quickly. <laughs> I didn't have anybody proofread it. And if you have a question, like, I really wish I knew what to do with my kid who. Let me know. I'll create a lesson for you because I've got one tips and tricks. It's just kind of like a grab bag or potpourri of suggestions. I'll put it in there. Okay, fantastic. Well, Susan, thank you so much for coming on the show and imparting thank your you. wisdom to all the desperate parents out there looking for <sighs> answers and trying to just make it through this. But I think that on the you know, the silver lining of this is I mm -hmm. feel so much closer to my daughter and I'm really cherishing this time to, to get to spend with her. You know, I think many of us are, we're being forced to spend more time with our children and it's been really mm -hmm. lovely, uh, you know, getting to know my child more and I'm feeling a lot closer, a lot more connected, a lot less stressed and hectic, you know, getting to the school and back and all the activities right. and all this stuff. It's, uh, it's been really a blessing in disguise. And, you know, I'll close on this note. I think it might be a good idea, maybe at night or at dinner time, to not force it and not too often. But every once in a while, I'll just say, is there anything positive that you've recognized since we've, all this has changed? And get your family's feedback on that. Because, Wendy, that is such a great practice to have that gratitude there. It's, it's a great antidote to grumpiness too. So that's a great idea. Thank you for bringing that up. And, and listen, if you're not really feeling grateful and able to see the silver lining some days, that's okay too. Yeah. <laughs> well, Susan, thanks for coming on. And everyone, thank, thank you. you so much for tuning in to the coronavirus support series. We have so many more amazing guests coming on. Tune in. Thank you so much for, for you know, taking the time to listen.